Luke 19, beloved Luke chapter 19, for our reading and consideration of the Word of God this evening as we return to our series in the Gospel of Luke. So Luke gives us an account of the ministry, the life and ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we continue through and we're getting very close to the closing stages of our Lord's ministry and His path to the cross. So we're coming this evening to a well-known portion. Back at the end of chapter 18, we have Bartimaeus, as the Lord comes nigh Jericho. Of course, there being two Jerichos, the one that fell in the Old Testament during the life of Joshua, and then the other one that was rebuilt close by, and that's the one where our Lord has come. And so when we begin reading in chapter 19, he's still there, he's making his way through, he's on his way to Jerusalem, and yet there's still, still ministry to be done. And so let us read the Word of God, Luke 19, verse 1. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. Never read that without thinking of the humorous way in which Dr. Paisley used to use that text when he would be quizzed by journalists, and usually assaulted by them, and he would charge them by, of getting in the way of people from seeing or coming to know the Lord by their lies and deceit and everything else, and the, the people couldn't see him for the press. <laughs> that was uh, his way of using that term. Of course, I heard a young preacher not all that long ago uh, some, well, some years ago, I was in Northern Ireland, not here, much to your relief, no doubt, where he made mention, reference to that text, and took it as if that's actually what it's saying. So, I was sat there in disbelief, and uh, was, took to heart the danger of taking a text as a pretext, and someone there not realizing that that's not actually what the text is saying. Anyway, that's all an aside, and... Uh, the humor of Dr. Paisley sometimes lost on people. But we come to verse 4, and he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they sought, they all murmured, saying, that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. May the Lord write His Word on our hearts and bless it to us. Tremendous privilege just to hear it read in our presence, but may God bless it as we consider it together. Let's pray. Let's seek the Lord. Our gracious God, we are thankful for all of Thy Word. And sometimes when we come to the familiar portions, we may not take time to think clearly about what it's saying, and we make all sorts of assumptions that we know exactly what the passage teaches, and our minds turn off. Let that not happen tonight. Grant that we might be alert, not simply to the passage itself, but the Lord, O oh God, speak to us. Thou art a speaking God. Thou us reveal truth to men. May we know that the Word is a living Word tonight. And to that end, then, come and stand in our midst, Lord Jesus. Grant that the Spirit may move. Come to me, the preacher. I need the infilling of the Spirit always. 
especially when the Word is open before us. But all who hear need the work of the Spirit as well. We pray for His ministry tonight. So may Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Tax collectors make for an interesting study in the Gospels. Viewed as Roman sympathizers, seldom are they seen in a positive light. In fact, rabbinic sources consistently align them with the same kind of way as robbers. So as you think about people who go about stealing from people, and especially in those days when they would buy, be by roadsides and they would come upon people to steal from them, that's how tax collectors were viewed. And many of them were. They were robbers in the sense that they took advantage of the Roman system. It was an occupation that opened the door to corruption, and many of them took advantage of that opportunity. Our Lord Jesus told the religious leaders of His day in Matthew 21, verse 31, Verily I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. And so you see Him going into the psyche of the people in that day and pairing harlots and publicans together so that the emphasis of the most sinful, or at least the perceived most sinful in society, those who are deemed worse, the worst in all of the community, were actually pressing in and receiving salvation before the religious leaders. Christ repeatedly plays on this assumption in people's minds that these are the worst kind of people. In Matthew 5, 46, if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same. Again, the assumption is, like, if, if these people love those who love them back, then what is the, the grand a testimony that you love others who love you in return. So Luke enjoys drawing attention to them. Over and over again, we have seen it. I know it's over an expanse of time, so you don't often think about it, but we have had many references to publicans as we have moved through the Gospel of Luke. They were baptized by John the Baptist all the way back in chapter 3. Then we have the call of Levi to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus in Luke 5. He also was a publican. We have the accusation from Christ's enemies that he was a friend of publicans and sinners in Luke 7. And the interest of the publicans are also shown in Christ's ministry in Luke 15. They're, they're gathering around. Publicans and sinners are gathering to hear him. And then we have a parable about a Pharisee and a publican in Luke 18. And then this account of Zacchaeus, a chief among the publicans. This is not only the last reference to publicans in the Gospel of Luke, but the last reference to a publican in the entire Bible. So why does the Spirit of God record these encounters? Why do we keep having our attention drawn to publicans or tax collectors? Is it so that we understand something about the tax system of the day? No, that's not the emphasis. That's not the reason. It's to show God's mercy to sinners. And the Lord is not ashamed or shy to highlight His mercy by showing how those who are perceived to be the worst are drawn in a saving knowledge to Christ. Again, Luke is addressing a largely Gentile audience. These are people who would assume that there can be no opportunity for us. We're not Jewish. We are, we are cut off. We have no privileges. We have no access. And so, Luke, to emphasize the love of Christ and to show His willingness to save all, highlights repeatedly that those who were considered like Gentiles in the Jewish community were called to Christ in salvation over and over and over again. Never once do we find our Lord condemning their occupation, saying you shouldn't be a tax collector, or discussing the amounts due and saying that there's extortion by the Romans. He never gets into that discussion as such. He doesn't develop that, what the tax system should look like and so on, where the money goes to and how just or unjust that may be. That's not developed. The only direction, in fact, in relation to publicans or tax collectors comes from John the Baptist who says, don't take more than you should. Don't extort more than you ought from people. In other words, he's not saying change your occupation. He's not saying you're not allowed to be a publican. He's simply saying there's a right way to go about the job. You come to Rome's tax system, of course, there may have been a complexity to it that we're not privy to. But the general idea of the time was that 
People in various areas would, would submit a bid. There would be contracts, opportunities in regions to, to gather the taxes of that area. And there were four different types of taxes, and they would, they would make these bids. It would be an auction type of scenario where they would bid to, to have the opportunity to gather the taxes for the people. And so those who would win them, of course, were given the responsibility to make up what they had promised would come in, and that's where the opportunity for extortion came in because people could actually gather in more and keep that which, they, which was beyond what was necessary to give to Rome. And so the opportunity for theft and fraud and so on was, was rife. So Zacchaeus was such a man. He was involved in this kind of work. And as such, he was hated and despised. And so as our Lord makes his way to Jerusalem... And the emphasis upon his ministry toward individual sinners comes more, fades away, let's say, and the focus upon him and his dialogue to his disciples and his path to Jerusalem comes into more crystal view. This is one of the last occasions where we have this kind of interaction where he deals with a man who's a sinner and draws him to himself. And so tonight, as we look at this well-known passage, I've titled it simply, The Guest of Sinners. Jesus, the guest of sinners, or Christ, the guest of sinners. And I want to look at it with you under a number of headings. First of all, Christ's impartiality to sinners, then his intervention of sinners, and then his interest in sinners. So let's look at this a little more as we consider this passage together. His impartiality to sinners. And there's two things I want us to consider here with regard to his impartiality. First of all, Whatever the unique uniqueness of the story, that is the story of the person. It doesn't matter to Christ what your story is. He has an interest. He has an impartiality, rather, towards men. And when we look at Zacchaeus, we have some details given to us regarding him that show us again that it didn't really matter. The Lord Jesus was willing to save such a person as this. First of all, we might think of his start. His start. How did he start in life, Zacchaeus? Well, we don't know his whole story. But we know his name, and so we know, therefore, he was given a Jewish name, a Jewish name that actually means that he was pure or innocent. Now, I don't know whether that was maybe just a family name that was given to him, or whether that was the desire and prayer of his parents, that this young man would be pure and innocent. Well, if that was their prayer and that was their desire, it certainly wasn't the impression that he gave to the community. And I don't know whether his parents were still alive when he decided to become a publican, but I'm sure they would have felt great shame as they saw their son become an outcast from the community, a shame to the entire family circle. So this was his start, given a name, a desire to be pure or to be innocent. There's also his stature, we're told, and this is interesting detail. It's, of course, the little song that the children sing about Zacchaeus being... Well, here I think you say a wee little man, uh, which seems a little uh, e extra words being added in there unnecessary. In Northern Ireland, talk about a very little man, but it, whichever of the words that you use, of course, that becomes the focus. Per Zacchaeus, this is all his, his Napoleonic uh, stature or whatever, uh, becomes the, em the emphasis of uh, people's minds. But anyway, you have him here described as being of small stature of little stature, verse 3. And I was thinking about how Scripture doesn't really deal with people in terms of their height very often. When you think about height, my first thought was to Goliath, of course, was he was huge. I don't know if there are many others that deal with the height of a man, but here you have it. And this was something he had to deal with in his life. He had to deal with the fact that he was little. He had to move through life knowing that. And of course, <laughs> Probably everyone, especially males, at some point have had some comment made to them about their height. It doesn't matter what height you are. You don't avoid going through life without someone making some reference to your height. Uh, it may be that you're, you're of short stature, and so someone makes remarks regularly about that. Maybe you're tall. And I've, one of our ministers, Patrick Baker, is six foot seven, and he's heard every single tall joke or remark that you're going to hear. You know, how's the air up there? And all the things that people say uh, to, to him. And he, he just rolls his eyes and usually has his own wit to respond to those remarks. 
But even if, even in, in school and so on, it, you, you can, even if you're just average, still remarks can be made about your height. Zacchaeus went through all of that, and the detail is given because of his short stature, he wasn't able to get through the crowd, he wasn't able to see Jesus, and then in an act of what would have been very an odd for someone of his position in life, climbed a tree. He climbs a tree. This is, this is odd. This is really weird. Like, imagine for a moment that you know, we go out there and we have a couple of trees, small trees, and often the children will be found climbing the trees, right? Now imagine we go out and we find Mr. Farr out there climbing the tree after a service. It would seem very odd to see him out there. That just doesn't seem to be the right activity for a person like that. This is similar. This is, this is bizarre for this professional person to climb a tree. People, there's a certain stage of life where you stop climbing trees, and yet Zacchaeus is found doing that very thing. So, we have also his station. He is chief among the publicans. So, those who were given responsibility of gathering taxes, sometimes they were given such large territories that they functioned as subcontractors, and they would have uh, slaves or servants who would also uh, be involved in the work of gathering taxes. So, he would have employees which would ex expand their influence and multiply their streams of income. So, he is chief among the tax collectors. And therefore, then, you have also his success. He is very rich. That's what we're told in verse 2. He was rich. So, the sense is this is a man who is weighty with wealth. He has wealth. And again, we don't know all the details as to how he conducted his business, but the assumption would have been, though people may not have known exactly how he did his business, the assumption would have been that he was a robber and a wicked man because he served the Roman Empire. So, you have these details, and I, and I point them out to you because they're in the narrative, and yet it doesn't matter whether you're short or tall, whether you're rich or poor, whether, whatever the details are, whether you had believing parents who gave you a very godly name or you have some wretched pagan name assigned to you, it doesn't matter. That's the point. There's an impartiality. Christ deals with men without partiality. He saves men. He gathers men. He shows His love to men. And so, whatever your story, that, that's really the point, whatever your story, whether it be akin to Zacchaeus or completely different, the Lord will save. It's the encouragement for us. So, whatever the uniqueness of their story, Christ is impartial. And then whatever the extent of their sin, whatever the extent of their sin, Look at verse 7. We're actually not told who this is referring to. When they saw it, they all murmured. We don't know who this is. It may just be the crowd that was gathered. It may be, again, certain Pharisees and religious leaders that were there. But they see what's going on. They see the Lord receiving Zacchaeus going to his home. And they say that he was gone to be guest. Jesus was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. Now, is this true? Was the man a sinner? Yes. Now, in their mind, they're thinking it of it in, in terms of categories. He is a sinner in contrast to us. We don't live his life. We're not categorized like him. And the sense is, this is the Lord Jesus again identifying with going into the home or household of those that you shouldn't go near. Some of what I read concerning publicans indicated their excommunication. They were cut off from religious life. And so you have an individual that has no access, has no right, in fact, that should be shunned by devout people in the community. Jesus, instead, joins with them. And of course, it's true. The man was a sinner, but not in the way they were applying it. They, weren't, they were thinking of it in terms of categories. He's a sinner and we're not. You understand, I hope you understand, we are all sinners before God. All of us come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. And when someone is identified as a sinner, it's true that all of us are in the same position. We are all sinners before God. 
There are parallels, however, and perhaps you've noted them, to Luke 15. If you go back there, Luke 15, just to refresh your memory. I made reference to verse 1 already. Luke 15, you have the threefold parable. Of course, the most well-known being that of the prodigal. But verse 1, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. So you have these worst type of people in the community gathering to listen to the words of our Lord Jesus. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured. Same idea. They murmured saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Our Lord Jesus then addressed that. I, I underlined when we were going through Luke 15 that part of what he does is he takes that accusation that was meant to be a negative and he uses it as a springboard to show you have no idea. You don't even understand the extent to which I receive sinners. Let me explain it to you. I'm not just sitting back willing to receive sinners. I go seeking after them. When there are 99 sheep that are safe, I go after the one that's lost. When there's nine coins, precious silver coins, in my hand but one is lost, I don't leave it lost. I sweep the house to find it. And when a sun goes off into the far country, I'm constantly looking at the horizon ready to receive him with open arms and gather him in. So that point is underlined, but it is lost on many. So that when you come to Luke 19, verse 7, whoever these people are, when they see the Lord Jesus going into the home of Zacchaeus, they all murmured. They all murmured. And people don't murmur all at the same time. There's always an instigator. There's always someone who starts it, and then it begins to spread. They all join in the folly of murmuring. They all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. So, again, is it true? Yes, it is. He, this man, is a sinner. And we know that he wasn't a saved man before he met with the Lord. Go to verse 9. When Jesus is with him, Jesus says to Zacchaeus, This day is salvation come to this house. This day. It hadn't before. Zacchaeus' home had been a godless home, a Christless home, a home without the peace of God, without the salvation of God, but now it has come. But here's a man who wasn't saved and was lost on his way to hell, and the Lord saved him. The Lord shows mercy to societal outcasts. I don't know what your past looks like or how it reads. I don't know how you feel about your own life. And it's quite possible. I have not been here that many years. It's quite possible there are things in your past that some people are aware of and it still, you feel it still clings to you. And how certain people interact with you is somehow colored by that past. That's how you feel. Note how Jesus has absolutely no reservations here and does not care at all what everyone is thinking and saying. He is impartial. Whatever the uniqueness of their story, whatever the extent of their sin, if you feel yourself to be the worst of sinners, that people despise you, it doesn't, it doesn't color how Jesus looks at you. If you can put it this way, Jesus makes up his own mind about you. So, we've seen the impartiality then, the sinners. The intervention. The intervention. And there's two things here I want you to note as well. That he intercepts in his providence and he instructs by his word. First of all, he intercepts in his providence. Providence is a glorious doctrine. 
providence. Sometimes when preachers discuss, or maybe when you hear the word providence and you try to explain providence, you get a little mixed up with your understanding of God's sovereignty. And I've dealt with this before, but I, I mention it again just because repetition can be helpful. There is overlap between God's sovereignty and God's providence. There's overlap. God's sovereignty refers to Him as being in authority, unhindered by the plans and whims of men, that He does what He decides, He plans and executes without any consideration, without any dialogue with people or any other being. He is sovereign. He needs no input, needs no help. Providence is the outworking of that sovereignty. Providence is adding purpose to His sovereignty. Sovereignty is something God is. Providence is the outworking of that aspect of God. So that when we look at the world and we see in the works of creation and providence, when we see the coming together of all that has been done by God, this is the sovereign God acting. He's giving purpose to His sovereignty, as it were. He's showing His sovereignty in His governing over the things in this world. And when you read verse 1, it looks like He has, the Lord Jesus really has no interest in anything in Jericho, and Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. It's like He's, I'm just passing through on my way somewhere else. Then we're told, behold, surprise, lo and behold, there's something to note. There's a certain man. We get his details. We learn of how he, in his curiosity and desire, runs and climbs up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. So that's all from Zacchaeus' position. This is what he's doing. And Jesus makes make sure to come to the place, verse 5, when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, and so forth. So the Lord Jesus deliberately comes right there. And there are crowds of people, enough that Zacchaeus has no hope of seeing Jesus or interacting with Jesus. He is swarmed and swallowed up by the mass of people that are there. So he climbs up into a tree. And the Lord Jesus doesn't just pass so that Zacchaeus can see him. He stops right there. He looks him in the eye and he calls him down. This is what the Lord does. He intercepts in lives by his providence. He intercepts. Think of it, believer. Did not the Lord intercept you providentially? If you grow up in the church, it can be harder to discern that sometimes, but it's no less true than it is of someone like Zacchaeus, that God brings certain things across your path sovereignly, intentionally, to deal with you. When I look back at my own conversion, one of the things that I marvel at, and I don't know even how this works together or if it has any influence upon my own salvation at all, but I lived in the same house for 16 years, and never once do I remember Christians from the Free Presbyterian Church knocking on my door. Now, they may have. I just may not have been in. Or I maybe have been too young to answer the door and know anything about it. But exactly, or maybe it's slightly less than a year before my conversion, two men knocked on my door and I answered the door, <laughs> and my, my mom already knew. She, I don't know how she knew, whether she saw them and she had a, a sense or whatever it was, because she deliberately told me, you go and answer the door. And I went oblivious and answered the door, and it was two men from the church that my grandmother attended. And I felt, in respect to my grandmother, I could not be rude. I had zero interest in what they had to say. Zero. 
And yet simply because I didn't want to bring any tarnishing to the name of my grandmother, I stood there for an hour and listened to them preach the gospel to me. I never had anyone explain the gospel to me like that before in my life that I remember. And again, I don't know what part it played in my own salvation, but it was no accident. It was providential. And you look back on your own life and you see the weaving together of how God brought things together so that you would pay attention, so that you would understand, so that you would be brought to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can't, you're not meant to miss this. When you read the details that Jesus came to the place, looked up and saw him, you think, preacher, you're making too much of that. Go to verse 10. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Christ declares his purpose statement. This is why I've come. So there are no accidents. It isn't just happen chance. He's not just walking past. He's, he's on a mission. Yes, he knew. He knew how that very sycamore tree would be used as an instrument in aiding the divine purpose when it first sprouted in the soil decades earlier. He knew that. He intercepts in his providence. And so it is tonight. If you're still in an unsaved state, you say, well, I'm always here, Pastor. I'm always here. There's nothing extraordinary or special. But it is. The fact that you're here There are numberless ways that you could not be here. And there's a reason why you are here. And the Lord Jesus passes this way in His Word. Why are you here to hear this message? It is to remind you afresh that the Lord Jesus comes by to sinners and calls them and saves them and transforms them. And the point isn't so that you simply know what happened to Zacchaeus, but so that you say, Can that happen to me? And you understand, yes. He will receive me. He will save me. He will change me. He intercepts in his providence. He instructs by his word. Verse 5 says, he said unto him. And what does he say? Make haste and come down. You say, again, that's just a detail. It's irrelevant. It's just part of, so we understand what's going on here. It doesn't, there's no real importance to it, but there is. There is, because verse 6 takes those same words and reflects them back. He made haste and came down. Now, when the Lord gives his word, what's the response? When you're hearing God's word preached to you, Is it purely for information? Is that the only reason? There's a preacher, me or someone else, giving information about God's Word. And you say, okay, I'll lodge that in. And some of you boys and girls, growing up in the church, that's how you deal with the Bible. The Bible is a book you become acquainted with, and it's information. Information that you store, whether intentionally or just you remember it because it's put before you, And so you're able to answer questions and quizzes. In Sunday school class, when a question is asked, you're able to answer its information. So whenever you hear the word, you you understand it in the sense that these are details that I can give back should I be asked a question, should someone ask me what this is about. I put it to you, that's not what the Bible is all about. There's more to it. When the Lord gives his word, when he says, make haste and come down, you are to make haste and come down. In other words, there is to be an obedience to the word, a response, not just a put storing it up in your head, but a response. What is the word saying to me? What's it calling me to do? What's it asking of me? And there ought to be in your heart, a sense of necessity and urgency to obey what it says. 
Zacchaeus didn't stay up there. He immediately made haste, quickly. Why is, does the Lord say make haste and come down? Well, he's on a mission. He's heading to the cross. And he has a very tight schedule. But he is making time, as it were. He has appointed this season. But it's a very short season. Make haste and come down. He makes haste and comes down and received him joyfully. So this is what the word is about. It's about hearing it and responding in obedience. You can know the Bible from cover to cover, and if you don't obey it, then all it does is add to your condemnation. It means your judgment is going to be worse. So, so be very careful. All of us here will be held account in terms of what we have heard. <laughs> I heard one preacher say, and I don't know if this will be true, he said, we will also be held accountable for the messages that we should have heard, but we didn't. That we ought to have been there, but we weren't. Or we should have been listening, but we did not. So this is how the Lord intervenes, providentially and by His Word. He doesn't just come into your life and say, here I am, Jesus. He always has a word. He always has a word. Unless, of course, you're already cut off. Unless, of course, you're already under judgment that is irreversible. Now, we're going to find such a man as that later on. Herod, who desired, who desired to hear and see Christ. And Christ says nothing. So it's a frightening thing. And of course, you ask, well, why did Herod go through that? I mean, you can flip over. Just to you see it? Well, maybe whet your appetite a little. Luke 23. Luke 23, verse 8. So again, you have this, this exchange. Pilate's trying to offload Jesus, get rid of the responsibility. He finds out that Herod is here and that him being over Galilee and Jesus being from Galilee, he sends him to Herod, verse 7. So verse 8, when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad for he was desirous to see him of a long season because he had heard many things of him and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. So there's been all this hype and thousands have seen Jesus, thousands have witnessed his miraculous power, thousands have been influenced by him, but Herod, the king, has not had his wish fulfilled. He has had, again, his appetite in some way prepared by John the Baptist and everything else that had gone on, including the wife of one of his servants being converted by Christ, brought to Christ. So verse 9, he questioned with him in many words, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him, and Herod with his men of war set him at naught and mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again to Pilate. He says nothing. He answered him nothing. It's one of the most sobering statements in all of this gospel, he answered him nothing. Jesus, who ordinarily, providentially meets with sinners and has a word for them. Here is an exception to the rule where providentially he is brought before a man and he has nothing to say. Herod, you see, had had a preacher. And he killed him. And God had no more to say to him. It's a frightening thought. Silence God's voice in your life, he may refuse to speak again. Well, this is not the case for Zacchaeus. The Lord comes into his presence and speaks to him, 
And he immediately responds. This is what you need to do. This is what you must do. You must be able to say, I have done what, let me use the words of, of Paul when he's in Athens and he preaches on Mars Hill. He uses language that God now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. That there's this urgency upon all men, God is commanding, that when you hear the gospel, when God comes face to face with you, when he puts his son before you, he commands you now. Repent. Mercifully, that's what Zacchaeus did. <clears throat> this brings us thirdly then, Christ's interest in sinners. His interest in sinners. What an interest he has. Summarized in verse 10. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So let's think about this. First, he seeks them. He seeks them. And in this passage is both exemplified in verse 5, because he makes his way right past where Zacchaeus is, and stated in verse 10. You don't have to convince Christ to have an interest in you, ordinarily. <laughs> he loves, he loves to, to come past into the presence of those who say, well, let's put it this way, you, when you ask the question, am I a sinner? And do I need saved? Now, if you answer those in the affirmative, Christ loves to come by. He loves to come by. Your heart's already been prepared by the Spirit. The Spirit has moved into your life so that you say, I am a sinner. I need to be saved. And it's at that point Christ just breezes in. He says, yes, you are a sinner. Yes, you need to be saved. And I am the Savior you need. And he seeks them. He seeks them out. I don't know what was going on in Zacchaeus' life. I don't know if he had got fed up with his wealth, whether he had been burned, whether he had gotten weary with just accumulating money to himself and seeing the emptiness of it all. Remember, this is, this is a tremendous, this, this passage has just come to mind. It's an illustration of what, remember what the Lord taught when the rich young ruler came and he went away sorrowful? And the Lord Jesus then taught how hardly can those that are rich enter the kingdom of God? And with men is impossible and so Peter, you know, they're all hearing what this is. And, you know, who then can be saved and so on? And the Lord makes this point. With man is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. You could have titled this message that, with God, all things are possible. Because here is a rich man being saved. God bringing him to himself. The Lord Jesus sees this one. The 90 and 9 have been gathered, as it were, and he sees the one and he goes after them. He seeks in order to save that which was lost. I love it. I love it. This is great. This is what gives me encouragement every Lord's Day when I'm coming with a particular emphasis, especially in the evening, to those of you still outside of Christ. Because I'm not reflecting an urgency that is born in my own heart. I'm reflecting an urgency that is born in the heart of the Son of God. This is why he came to save. And he loves it. He loves to just come into a meeting like this and see those still lost and bring them onto himself and transform their lives. He loves to do that. So he seeks them and he saves them. He saves them. That's what's stated again in verse 10, seek and to save. And this is what happens to this man. You see it in a couple of ways. First, the conversion in his salvation. Verse 8 Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, there's a good sign, isn't it? Lord, here's a man who has power and authority. Here's a man who doesn't recognize. You know, you think of the religious leaders and their authority in this community, and he has lived his life with a stubborn resolve. I don't care what you think. He, he, this is a man with thick skin. He is prepared to be ostracized and cut off from nearly everyone and starved of spiritual benefit. And in one sense, not care what anyone thinks. This is therefore not the kind of person who says Lord to someone easily. But now he's saying, Lord, 
Have you ever said that? Have you ever turned to Jesus and said, Lord? In the sense that I see you as my Lord? Verse 9 as well. His conversion is clear. The language we've already considered. This day is salvation come to this house. For as much as he also is a son of Abraham. There's tremendous new covenant truth that's there. Yes, in one sense he is of the line of Abraham. He's a Jew. But there's an opening up here of the theological truth. He is, he is, he is making way here for what Paul will build upon. It's those that are faith that are the children of Abraham. So this is his conversion. Also his change. Not only the conversion and salvation, the change in salvation. And both are always there. The Lord doesn't save people. He doesn't convert people without changing them as well. He has changed. Verse 8. The half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. He's laying out a statement here. In the immediate, all of my accumulated wealth, I'm going to take half of it and give it away. Why? Why would he do that? When I was thinking about this, I thought, first of all, in my mind I'm thinking, well, it would help establish his name in a new light in the community, wouldn't it? I mean, you can say what he liked, this man's a sinner, but there's, there's going to be hundreds and hundreds of, of poor people, perhaps, that are going to benefit from his wealth, and they will not have you say one bad thing against this man. Now I thought about it a little more, and I thought, that's not the reason why. He's not doing this to gain credibility to his own name. He is doing this to bring honor to Christ's name. It is him and his credibility that matters, not Zacchaeus. This is what we're told by our Lord Jesus, of course, in Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify you. No. Glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's why. You have a wonderful historical aspect to this in Acts. Go to Acts 6. The power of a changed life, especially when people are extraordinarily, extraordinarily generous. Acts 6. And you have the appointment of the, the deacons on this occasion because of the Again, the challenges of a growing church. So they're set apart, and because of that, because of the deacons and because of their labors, coinciding with the labors of the apostles, verse 7 says, The word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiply, not applied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Now, why, why did a multitude of the priests bow the knee to Christ at this moment? Why? It is my opinion that the driving factor behind this was the unusual love and charity and consideration of the community that was being expressed by those early believers as they sold their goods, as they helped the poor, as they distributed, instead of doing it in some religious way where they're, again, our Lord condemned, the way the Pharisees went about taking advantage of widows and so on. And you have in that group, you have, you have these, these, silent, <laughs> these silent priests, these, these in-the-background priests, perhaps, they're not at the forefront, and you know, there's, there's things that they see going on in their religion that they don't quite, they know it doesn't square. They know it. But, you know, you're kind of part of the system. and You're, you're brought along. And now they're seeing for the first time true 
biblical faith expressed. When they start weighing up in their minds, where does the truth lie? What, to what am I showing my allegiance to? Because over here, where we claim to have all the truth, there is no love, there's no charity, there's no, there's no consideration. It is twisted and distorted and false and empty. And over here, these people who are, who are just desirous to help in whatever way they can, they're just full of love. And finally, their, their conscience is so struck by the generosity that they can no longer deny that the truth is with the followers of Jesus Christ. Zacchaeus then was not giving half of his wealth away to gain some reputation to himself, but to change, help change the perception people had of the Lord because he was despised. Look, the criticism in verse 7 is not simply about, in fact, it's not primarily towards Zacchaeus. The criticism in verse 7 is towards the Lord Jesus. He was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. Zacchaeus knows this. So his generosity is to help people understand this is what this man does. He changes your life. And often Zacchaeus, <laughs> people read verse 8 in such a way that he did steal from people and he had to restore fourfold. That's not what he says. If I have taken, if, if, if there comes any legitimate charge, I will restore him fourfold, which is him obeying the law, to put it in simple terms. So he seeks them, he saves them, and finally he stays with them. His interest is such that he stays with them. When you think of Luke 15, and we often dwell on that, that Christ is the friend of sinners. He is the friend of sinners. Here, this passage, don't forget it, he is also, though it be said in a condemning way, he is the guest of sinners the guest of sinners. I love it. To be a guest, of course, is to lodge. The word has the idea of stopping on your journey in order to rest, to cast things aside, all the burden of, of the things you're carrying on your journey, and to lodge for a while. So our Lord Jesus, He guests, He becomes a guest with Zacchaeus. He lodges with Zacchaeus. Now, this is what's wonderful, because our Lord Jesus is going to, in His humanity, leave Zacchaeus. But by His Spirit, He will never leave Zacchaeus again. He has not just gone to lodge and dine with him. He has gone to lodge with Zacchaeus and never leave him, ever. He puts a witness in Jericho for his own name in the person of Zacchaeus. Never to leave, at least while Zacchaeus was there. And this is what the Lord does. He comes to lodge in the heart of sinners. He comes to dwell with sinners and stay with them. Child of God, don't forget that. Wherever you go, you're the hands and feet of Christ. You're his body. You're members of his body. Wherever you go, you represent Jesus Christ. In your speech, in your conduct and behavior, in your manner, all of that, all of it, it's, it's you reflecting Jesus Christ. This is your priority. This is your call. This is not something you just are when you walk through the doors of this church. This is what you are as you walk out and engage with the community, you are reflecting Jesus Christ because He has lodged in your heart. And he governs there. And He starts pulling the strings and dictating and saying, I know you want to say that. I'm telling you, don't. <laughs> don't say it. I know you want to do that. But I'm saying, don't. 
Don't do it. I know, I know you find this really hard to do. But you know you must. This is the right thing. And you go through your life governed by this authority in your soul, the abiding presence of Jesus Christ in the heart and in the soul. Lodging with sinners. So, as I say, Christ left Jericho, but he never left Zacchaeus. Christ, the guest of sinners. Is he a guest in your home, in your life, is he? Does he lodge in your life? Is he always there? Are you conscious of him always being there? Do you hear his voice? Do you wake up desirous to commune with him? Do you make decisions like Zacchaeus? The first words are, Lord. Wondering what your Lord wants you to do. It's not a burden. It's not a burden. It's actually a great joy. You know, one of the worst things in life is to imagine that you're in control of everything. That might work for a while until all of a sudden you get a reality check that you're not in control. And then your whole philosophy, your whole sense of being that here I am, me, in control, shattered by God. And you're a broken man and a broken woman. The whole government of your life has been broken in pieces. How much more peace there is for the person who submits and says, no, I'm not, I'm not master of this ship. I'm not governing its direction. I'm not in, controlled, in control of what goes on. I'm a servant. And my master lodges with me. To him I give my allegiance. There's great rest there. Oh, that you would understand it. Let's bow together in prayer. Christ is the guest of sinners. What are you waiting for? The Lord is here. He will, he will come in response to your prayer. And He will save in response to your cries of repentance. question is, why don't you sense that now is the accepted time? Would it not be a wonderful thing for it to be said that today salvation has come to this house? Today has salvation come to my heart? Where you are, you can cry out to the Lord. He will save you. And for those of you backslidden, in some way you look back on times when Christ was a very welcome guest in your life, but you've tried to shove him out the door. He's, he's more of a hindrance. He's like a guest that's not really welcome. He's outstayed as welcome, perhaps. You just want to get on with your life. Wake up. Wake up. Lord, we pray, have mercy. Help us to see a perishing world like Jesus saw a perishing world. We meet with people lost and in their sin every day. And you've called us to be 
witnesses. And yet we are so proud, so blind, so caught up in our own little world that even when there's a wide open door of opportunity, we don't speak or share the gospel. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He came to seek and to save the lost. Help us to help those lost ones by pointing them in the direction of the cross. Hear our prayers. Thank you again for being with us today. Aside from all the flaws and shortcomings, we have thy word and how precious it is. Precious it is. Help us to love it and obey it. Be with us in our time of fellowship and go with us to our homes. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Spirit be with all thy people now and evermore. Amen.